Welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution virtual walk entitled 7,000 Years of Cotswold Enterprise and this is the car park on the shallows in Saltford where you would park to start this walk. From the car park which is down here near the bottom right hand side of the slide we'd walk along this road here behind the trees to the Bird in Hand pub through the car park up onto the Bristol Bath cycle track and we would cross the Midland Bridge just here where those figures are if you can see them and behind the trees walk along the cycle track until there's a left turn down some steps and onto the track for Kelston up through the farm known as Park Farm up to the village of Kelston here and we'd go on a zigzag track to surmount the west face of Kelston Round Hill where there's a clump of trees unmistakable on the top. Down along the saddle to Bath Racecourse and a long Bath Racecourse along the plateau at the top of the Cotswolds to Little Down Iron Age Fort. And we'll drop down through the village of North Stoke onto the meadows by the River Aden again to the hamlet of Kelston Mills and back along behind these trees up onto the cycle track back to the bird in hand and down again on this road to return to our car and then to home. This is the pub, which is the effective start and finish of the walk. Fine pub it is too. We go through the car park and this is the Bristol Bath cycle track and this is the Midland Bridge you can see here on the River Avon. We'll walk 200 metres up this track. And we turn off left here. Go to the left of this stone wall, down some steps and up onto this track that takes us up to the Cotswolds. Through the fields of Park Farm, Kelston. You can see 400 cattle, not in this photograph, but you can see the black and white Frisian cross. They produce a million litres of milk per year and the farmer, Mr Graham Padfield, has created Bath Soft Cheese Limited, a very successful company to make something from the cheese, to add value to it. If we were to go back 300 years, this would have been a vast open field full of little strips that the villagers would own. From about 1700 to 1850, now you can call it enterprise or ruthlessness, but the wealthier farmers and landowners persuaded Parliament to allow them to break up or to buy up the village strips and then to enclose them with hedges like this, making smaller fields. The Enclosures Act, as it was called. The poor old villagers instead of owning the land they were working on had to then come back as hired hands often at very low wages and the track leads on up to park farm itself and we can see bath soft cheese this is where it's made and this is the cafe that Hugh Padfield, Graham Padfield's son, has designed in 2019, opened in 2020, and this bit was added on in 2020. The bit that we can see with the pillars holding up the sloping roof. This is what it looks like from the round the corner. And the lady is standing by a milk machine, producing the farm milk or distributing the farm milk to people who come from Kelston Village, Saltford Village, Canesham and Bath to get real farm milk. 
very enterprising scheme it was. This little path takes us from the cheese shop up to Kelston village to the forge, Kelston forge. And here is the ex forge master. He's now retired, gone off to surf in Cornwall. And he's telling a visitor, this is where the old bakery used to be. And John Holder's sons, if they were home from university, would work with him. This is Max, who is an archaeological conservationist. This is the sign for Kelston Forge. Now available if you want to become a forge master. And here we've got a strange logo on the wall, a strange symbol, and it's Inigo A. Jones was the landowner. He combined the letters I, A, J into this motif that we can see in the black plaque on the wall. I, A, J from the left and then a mirror image, J, A, I to the right. He reconstructed the village in the late 19th century. And from the forge, if we look along towards Bath to the east, we can see this distinctive building here called the Tower House. It was built by the owner of Park Estate, which is two kilometres further on from the tower from where we're looking and on the way to Bath fine upstanding building and Joseph Neal the landowner <coughs> built Tower House for his Italian mistress so she could climb up to the top of the tower and wave her white handkerchief at him. How romantic, how enterprising. Back on the left you'll see the pub called the Old Crown and if you go through the pub and just before the garden door, you will see a diagram on the wall. And the diagram was created by somebody who lived, who was the owner, Lord of the Manor in Kelston, John Harrington, who lived in Queen Elizabeth's time. He was an Elizabethan courtier. And here in Kelston, he invented the Ajax water closet. And he was so enterprising, he even showed it to Queen Elizabeth I. No doubt he pulled the flush, but she thought it was too noisy, and consequently it didn't catch on. We're entering the Cotswold, area of outstanding natural beauty. was created in 1966 and reinforced by laws in 2000 and the objects are to make to make it available to the public and also to preserve the ways of life of people who are living there. The largest area of outstanding natural beauty in the country, 760 square miles. And some of the buildings of the farms, this was an old barn, have been changed just like the uh, forge was changed from a bakery and goodness knows what it will become now. This barn was converted into a carpenter's factory where sets are designed and made for TV, stage and even film productions. Some of the barns higher up the hill, this is more or less halfway up, 110 metres above sea level. This is Coombe Barn and these are the holiday cottages which have a lovely view out to the west. Now some people say this is the commodification of farm buildings and they don't like them. But when you've got that view, what do you do if you're a farmer and you're up against it? I believe that uh, local planning committees 
have to take each case on its merits. They're rarely applauded, often criticised, but my view it, for this development in particular is that it's a positive one. It's provided tourists with a lovely place to stay, looking out here towards the Southern Valley and the Brecon Beacons, and it's allowed the surrounding land to be kept in gainful farming use. We're almost at the top of the round hill now. Uh, you won't often see as many birds, rooks and jackdaws as you see now, but it's a, it's a fine hill to climb in any weather. Here's another view of the ascent up to that uh, clump of trees that can be seen from all over this area between Bristol and Bath. And uh, this this hill, even for people who've never climbed it, has got a sentimental, people feel they're coming home when they see it from a distance. Now here's a view to the west, across to the Welsh hills, and you can see the seven bridges, the two of them. The left hand one is now called the Prince of Wales Bridge. Fine view. And on the top of the hill is a very flat area of uh, almost plateau land. And the, the farmer who used to farm this, Andy Dinham, when he retired, he'd seen flints on the, uh, on the fields many times, but he decided he'd have a look. And he found that they found a lot of flints when he had them checked. The, um, Archaeologists came out to have a look and they said that this was two napping floors, flint factories dating back 7,000 years. This is where people would sit and chip flakes off big pieces of flint and the flakes then could be used for scraping, for boring, for cutting uh, animal skins and other things that came to mind. Here are some of Andy's finds, and the particular one that we're really interested in is the one with the two arrows showing to it, a late Mesolithic rejuvenated blade core. Now this was produced by somebody 7,000 years ago. And I see people sitting up on top of the round hill, chipping these flints, maybe trading them with people who've come from this part, particular part of the world where Bath is now, up the Cotswold Way. This was on a, on a through route called the Jurassic Way, all the way from here, near Bath, to Northamptonshire, 150 miles north. Here is Andy Dinham in the middle, just behind the uh, trigon trigonometrical point, with Dr Jenny Lunn, who is the Royal Geographical Society um, organiser for Discovering Britain, where this walk was first created. And that's the author on the left hand side, with some of Andy Dinham's finds shown in the section. And here, in 2014, the Royal Geographical Society um, a group of people from the Royal Geographical Society had a field trip on, along this walk and a fine time was had by all in lovely weather. You can see what a great view it is from the top. Looking out to the south, we've got the Mendip Hills. On a very, very clear day, you can see Exmoor, which is 55 miles, getting on for 90 kilometres to the south. But that's only on a very, very clear day. Here's the Cotswold Way coming up from Bath. I see these flint nappers selling their flints to traders coming along here. So traders might be carrying animal skins and they barter an animal skin for some good uh, flint tools. And then off they go along this hedgerow we can see here up to the horizon and on the Jurassic Way, as it's been called, all the way 
north through Gloucestershire and uh, eventually ending up, in, ending up in Northamptonshire. The funny thing is there are no flints found up on the round hill. The flints can only be found down in the valley where there are gravel deposits with flints in where um, Ice Age or streams after the Ice Age would have deposited flints maybe from Salisbury Plain. And I wonder if <clears throat> the uh, flint nappers sent off the young books of the time and said, earn your corn, go down into the wild woodlands down below with all the wild animals, collect flints and bring them back up here and you will be a man, my son or daughter. We walk along the Cotswold Way and look at the hedgerow to the right. That is a line of a, an ancient Roman road and we'll come to it in the next slide. So, Bath is behind us, Aquasulis, and the Romans 2,000 years ago would walk from Bath if they wanted to go to the sea to take their materials for trade. They'd walk on 20 kilometres to where the River Avon meets the River Severn at a Bonai, which is now called Sea Mills. And they'd take the galleys and off they'd go. Ditto, Roman traders would come up here and then maybe carry their wares um, on mule track or uh, on horseback to Bath and beyond into central southern England. But we go straight ahead, we go further up towards the top of the Cotswolds and we go through this gate into a new woodland, the woodland of Shiner's Wood. Now why Shiner? Well, Shiner was a horse. The Collymore family who farmed this area used to have a farm in Wiltshire. It was a Starveacre farm. They couldn't make it work. They were given land in Abergavenny. So they went to Abergavenny and it became the First World War. In the First World War soldiers came and requisitioned Shiner and another horse on the farm took them off to the First World War. <clears throat> the other war horse went down with the ship. But Shiner survived. She survived the war, survived the trip back and came back to Abergavenny whereupon after the First World War the Collymore family were told there was excellent land going cheap here in Kelston. They came and they bought it and Shiner spent his last years roaming these fields. Became a favourite horse and when Chrissy Collymore was asked what are we going to call the wood? The, the war horse Shiner came to mind so it's Shiner's wood. So it shows that even the hard grind of farming has its moments of romance. Here is Shiner's Wood as it was in 2011. The trees are now approaching maturity. We go through the wood up to the ridge at the top, which is called Prospect Style, which is misleading because it's now the gate. So at Prospect Style, Prospect Gate, if you want, we can look back to the Round Hill and further to the Mendips, and we have a topograph to help us. A topograph is a stone plinth with a metal sheet on top in this half a circle as you can see with inscriptions on showing the viewpoints and you can see in all directions. If we look over to the east and uh, zoom your camera in as far as it will go you can see King Alfred's Tower see it on a little uh, spot on the top of the hill and that's overlooking down to the right down to the south overlooking Longleat country house so that's 20 miles away 
30 kilometers or thereabouts. And to the southeast, you've got the Mendip transmitter on Penn Hill here on the Mendips. Another 20 miles away. So good views. Whereas behind us, we've got Bath Racecourse. This is the highest race course in the British Isles. There's been horse racing as an organised spectator sport in Bath since 1728 and here at Lansdowne since 1811. These flat plateau top fields were relatively inexpensive and were within an hour's walk from central Bath so ideal for horse racing. During the Second World War of course it was requisitioned and used as a landing field by the RAF. It's another good example of the adapting the uses of land. Oh, and the Romans built a fort here 2,000 years ago as well. Now, conventional thinking suggests that people in the Stone Ages lived high up here. They also lived on coastal beaches and coastal marshes because high up on the hills and on beaches and in marshes, trees were sparser people could, and people could move about more easily than in the thick forests of the river valleys. So just imagine skin, skilled flint nappers working away up on the hills here 7,000 years ago. I wonder if they would be sending the young bucks of the tribe, the young fellows and the girls, down into those dangerous woodlands with the wild animals to collect flint because there is no flint up here on the tops. There's flint which is perhaps picked up from the chalk of Salisbury Plain and brought down by the rushing meltwater streams after the Ice Age down onto the lowland river terraces. So maybe the young'uns brought the flints back up to the flint nappers and that was their rite of passage into adulthood. As we walk towards the west from the race course, we can see Little Down Iron Age Fort. You might walk past this and not really notice what it's all about. But the arrows showed two rampart walls and a ditch between, between them. And the rampart walls would have had wooden palisades, perhaps stonework as well, and would have been an obstacle to rival tribes in the Iron Age, we're talking 2,500 years ago to 2,000. And of course the Roman centurions, they came along and they just knocked all of these Iron Age forts off one after the other with their superior wartime skills. And here we have Bronze Age round barrows, even older than the Iron Age. So these are now 3,000 years old. Implements were found in here, including a sun disk, which some people believe came from Europe and some people believe came from Ireland. But there's no doubt at all that our ancestors from the Bronze Age were trading with Europe and Ireland and Scandinavia at that time. So lots of evidence of people living up on the tops from 7,000 years ago to the Romans. And then people have decided they prefer to live down the hill. So here in the distance, we can see the city of Bristol. This is a path through the Iron Age fort. And why would you want a fort up here on the top of the hill? because you could see the enemy coming for days away. Look at those views. Out to the north, you can even see the Malvern Hills, not very clearly on this slide, but again on a clear day, you can see those 45 to 50 miles away, 80 kilometers. May Hill up here is very interesting. I don't know if you can see the arrow showing May Hill. Anyone who is farming sheep within sight of May Hill can, can, can join the May Hill 
consortium and you can buy farm materials cheaper than if you were buying them yourself. Here's the Cotswold Hills, there's May Hill and the Forest of Dean over to the left and the Malverns in between. Fantastic views. And looking south to the Mendip Hills and over to Exmoor on very, very, very clear days. Again, 80 kilometres away, Dunkery Beacon on Exmoor. Terrific views from Iron Age Fort of Little Down. And here we've got a high willow tree. Now, of course, willows live near water. There's this big spring down here. But we are more interested in the sheep. Here are Kevin Harrison's sheep, and uh, the sheep were known as the lions of the Cotswolds. They made so much money for the farmers in medieval times. Wool from Cotswold sheep found its way, was exported to Flanders especially, and to Italy, and... Uh, the continental weavers paid very well for the wool. Cotswold farmers and merchants grew rich and bu built splendid houses and churches. And wool's not what it was, but lamb meat is. And here's prize winning sheep with the chair of the English Sheep Association looking on. Kevin crosses the Cotswold sheep with swale days. Swaledale sheep from Yorkshire. They'll give a hardy uh, sheep which gives terrific meat. And this uh, is one of my favourite parts of the walk, just this little bend in the dappled sunlight. It's what the area of outstanding natural beauty is all about. So down we come, that uh, lovely little lane, to the hamlet of Kelston Mill. Kelston Mill was a brass mill. And you can see the remains of the mill here. This is the annealing furnace tower of the mill. The mill itself was powered by water power, but the furnace was required to heat up the brass itself. So you'd put the brass in halfway up the tower where the, the flames and the, uh, the heat of the charcoal and then coal would make the brass malleable. The trip hammers powered by the river would bang the mill, bang the brass into shape, shaped by the craftsmen who worked it. And herein lies a story. The brass mills along the River Avon and in the centre of Bristol were created by Abraham Darby just after the turn of the 1700s, 1702 3 he was creating brass mills in the middle of Bristol. Then he came out and founded them out all along the River Avon. But he didn't have the skilled craftsmen. They weren't, they weren't available in Bristol. So he went over to where they were found best, and they were in the Netherlands. Well, Abraham Darby did a trip over there, talked to some of the brass people, persuaded them to come back to emigrate, in effect, to the Bristol area. And those Dutch names, particularly Ollis and Frankham, are still here to this day. Interesting, isn't it? The Protestant work ethic that fueled the Industrial Revolution in Britain was actually created by Catholics in this part of the world. The brass mill has changed its function over the years. It uh, went out of business in the early 20th century and is now a marina, as we can see here. More enterprise going on. But it's private and you've got to keep out unless you want to buy a mooring for your boat. What a great name. Brass Mill Cottages, Brass Mill Lane, Kelston Mills. 
and in the census of 1850, Mr. Ollis and Mr. Frankham both lived here. Change of use is also obvious when we walk down to the river from Kelston Mills and look across. This used to be an old mill, a fulling mill, but when John Frankham and John Haw canalised the river and built a weir and a lock here, barges were coming by and stopping as their boat went through the lock and of course refreshment would be fine. So the miller changed his building from a fulling mill into the Jolly Sailor pub which lasts to this day and people love to come out to this pub from Bristol and Bath and places in between for the view over the river and up to uh, North Stoke and Kelston Round Hill. There's a Jolly Sailor Inn on the right and more boat orientated um, enterprise sail makers next door to it. There's a long narrow boat going into the lock. Bristol Boats Limited. Again, a little marina here and um, a chandlery for boats along the river. More enterprise on, the, on our walk. Next to it, Saltford Sailing Club, which is thriving with events every Sunday. We walk along the river. Here's the river between us and the White House on the bluff and underneath the rainbow. And here's an interesting story. Along the road that runs on the other side of the valley, after a flood in November 2012, one of the locals found this little round coin. He didn't know whether it was a coin or just a piece of stone in the road. He took it to Bristol Museum and they were excited about it. They thought it might be something special. They sent it to the Bristol Music, sorry, the British Museum in London, and they confirmed it was one of only five Carthaginian coins ever found of this ilk in Britain. All of them found on trade routes. So could Carthaginian traders over 2,000 years ago at the time of Hannibal have been coming up the River Severn all the way around the southwest peninsula up past the emerging Bristol and up the River Avon perhaps to Bath and to trade with again with central southern Britain and could they have dropped a coin overboard which was resurrected later by a flood and found by one of the locals interesting story interesting conjecture more enterprise on our walk. We retrace our steps across the Midland Bridge and now we're back at the Bird in Hand where we started. Well this walk has told the story of how people and lived have lived and worked in this area for the last 7,000 years, how they've been involved in a wide variety of enterprises from prehistoric flint tool making to brass manufacturing, sheep and dairy farming, organic food production, cheese, and from contemporary farming to cafes, to leisure and tourism, how people have made use of the physical landscape and its natural resources. So how the river's been used for freight transport, to drive brass mills, and to nurture the leisure boating industry, how the steep valley sides were suited for grazing sheep and cattle, how the plateau was ideal for horse racing and for an airstrip. We've seen how people who used to live on the tops of the hills have moved progressively downhill to live, from the tops to the terraces and to the floodplain like Kelston Mills in modern times. Another important feature of this walk has been seeing how buildings, large and small, have changed 
as individuals and organisations have seen new opportunities for enterprise. 7,000 years of Cotswold Enterprise. Well, I hope you've learned something on this virtual BRLSI walk and have enjoyed yourself. I have. That's the end of the walk.